Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Ann Kuppinger from the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center, and I'd like to welcome you to webinar number four in our series of webinars on the home and community-based services under the Children's Waiver um, with some information on the children's system transformation and how it impacts those services. So the services we're going to be covering today are family peer support, youth peer support and training, and crisis intervention um, as interim home and community-based services. And before we get started, just um, a few um, items of housekeeping. Uh, the slides from today's webinar will be posted within the next week, um, as well as the recording of this webinar. You will be able to access those on the MCTAC website. If you go under the calendar function you'll, uh, and navigate to today's date, um, you'll find that recording and the slides posted there. Everything in today's presentation is uh, current information as of today. Um, sometimes uh, things do change, so we encourage you to not consider this a policy document, but to refer to official documents um, for complete information. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, we really encourage you to chat those questions into us throughout the webinar. Don't wait until the end. Um, and that way we'll be able to take a look at those and organize them and get to as many as possible at the end of the webinar. The way you do that is through the chat function. Um, you may see a screen to, on the right-hand side of, of your computer screen. There is an opportunity for you to chat those questions in. If that um, box is not open, you can click on the speech bubble at the bottom of your screen and it'll open up the chat box. And in the drop-down menu, you can select the host and chat your questions to the host. And with that, I'll turn it over to Meredith Ray Labatt from the New York State Office of Mental Health. Hi, Ann, thanks so much. Um, uh, thanks everyone, as Ann said, this is Meredith Ray Labatt with the New York State Office of Mental Health, and I'm joined here with Tanya Rollison from the Department of Health, who will be doing today's presentation with me. So um, as Anne noted, we are going to be talking about family peer support services, youth peer support and training, and crisis intervention as interim home and community-based services, and we'll talk about what that means shortly. Uh, Anne already said that. <laughs> so we'll be going over uh, some general key concepts early on in the presentation to get an overview of the services and how they'll function. Then we'll dive into each individual service and talk about uh, the services specifically and uh, what's required under each of the services. And then we'll talk about the um, HCBS eligibility and the crosswalk of services. So hopefully all of you have seen this many times um, in a vari a various webinars and presentations by the state, but this is the most up-to-date timeline in regards to the children's transformation. Um, as you'll see, there's a, a, a many activities that are going to be happening over the next couple of months uh, in a phased approach. We've already completed two of them, so hopefully all of you are already aware that we've implemented OLP, CPST, and PSR services, the new state plan CFTSS services. Um, we've uh, transitioned kids who are in the HCBS waiver into those services. We're working on right now a transitioning waiver care coordination into health home care management, and we're working to prepare with CMS uh, for the transition of the children's waivers into one children's consolidated waiver. Moving forward, we're going to be having a number of different activities happening this July. Uh, all of you hopefully are aware that um, while we're talking about family peer support, youth peer support, and crisis intervention as an interim HCBS, for family peer support starting in July, Family peer support will move into uh, a, becoming a children and family treatment support services, a CFTSS services, and also move into managed care in July. We're also moving a number of behavioral health services uh, into managed care that were carved out uh, for children. In addition to including SSI children into uh, managed care, and we're going to start uh, phasing in an, an expansion of capacity of the HCBS uh, Children's Consolidated Waiver in July as well. Very exciting. For the children's waivers, uh, those will begin to transition to managed care in October along with the foster care population. And then starting in January of next year, we will also be um, moving youth peer support and crisis intervention into the state plan as a CFTSS service. So that's very briefly and quickly the timeline. Um, and so you have it uh, here on this slide and you can reference it at any time. <laughs> 
Um, so again, as we mentioned, starting in April, five, I'm sorry, I don't know why I said five, six <laughs> of the children's current 1915C waivers are going to be consolidating. Uh, the waivers themselves are going to be closing, um, except for the Care at Home 1 and 2 DOH waiver. We're, we're using that waiver to consolidate. We're, uh, the others will be closing and all um, consolidating into one children's waiver with a wide array of HCBS service so that children who have um, multiple disabilities or multiple needs can now get access to a wide array depending on their individual needs. Previously, children were only restricted to the number of services that were under their particular waivers. Um, now we can really serve children with uh, comorbid uh, needs or disabilities in, in a new and exciting way with a larger array of access to individualized services. Um, and, I, and I think I touched on the rest, uh, and we'll be moving these waivers into managed care in October as well. A little bit more detail, which I discussed about the timeline. All right, so um, the home and community-based services and, and what we are calling children and family treatment support services are, are different services, and as a result, they have different requirements, processes, and pathways to care. So what's interesting and unique about uh, that is that while family peer support, youth peer support and training, and crisis intervention are, are interim HCBS services, the pathways to care for those particular services will actually follow that of home and community-based services, even though those services will eventually become CFTSS services. So we'll talk more about that later. Um, obviously, as all of you hopefully know, uh, only providers who are designated can provide these services. Um, the services have a lot of built-in flexibility and allow for creativity, so they should be able to be provided in a, in a number of different, different ways. Um, again, we're always focusing on individualizing to the child's unique needs. And as we said earlier, uh, waiver capacity uh, and slots, as of April 1st, uh, and we're consolidating the six waivers. We will be consolidating using the capacity uh, available in those six waivers. But starting in July of this year, we'll actually be adding on additional capacity and expanding it for greater access um, and additional um, ability to serve more children starting in July. The expansion of, of access to the waiver, the children's waiver, will begin in July of 2019 and will expand every year for three years um, until we have no restricted capacity at that time. Okay. So more specifically about the services that we're talking about today, um, the transition of, of children in, from the six waivers into the consolidated waiver requires that New York State assure CMS and assure those people involved in the transition have what's called continuity of care, that whatever services they were receiving prior to any changes that we made, they're able to continue receiving after those changes. Uh, and so as a result, because Children today, uh, specifically in the uh, OMH waiver for the peer services and for crisis intervention services, aspects of that are both in the OMH waiver and uh, the Bridges to Health waiver under the Office of Children and Family Services. We had to assure that children who have those services on their plans of care today were able to retain those services on their plans of care uh, after April 1st when we move into the children's waiver. So we had to, um, uh, because those services uh, are not moving into CFTSS services until after April, we had to assure that those services were available for children under HCBS in that interim period, hence the term interim HCBS. So um, all the services uh, that we're talking about today are required to obviously be provided in accordance with service description, staff, quali staff qualifications, excuse me, uh, training requirements, et cetera, all outlined in the HCBS manual. You'll note I actually put HCBS manual here because uh, his, we, have been, we had been saying CFTSS manual, but for ease of use and um, we have also inserted these three services into the HCBS manual. So as someone who's providing interim HCBS services, you will be reflected uh, family peer support, youth peer support uh, and training, and crisis intervention are also reflected in the home and community-based services manual as well with all of the detailed information about um, staff qualifications and such. Um, so while services are authorized HCBS, um, they will only be allowed to be provided to HCBS enrolled children. So um, starting in April, um, 
while these services will be made available, they will only be made available to children who are HCBS enrolled uh, until the services are transitioned to CFTSS services. So starting in April, it's only for HCBS children. So as a result of these services being um, a, uh, an HCBS service, because they're not uh, considered CFTSS quite yet, an LPHA recommendation, so hopefully all of you are aware that for CFTSS services, um, a recommendation from a licensed practitioner of the healing arts is required. Uh, during the time at which these services are available to HCBS children alone, an LPHA recommendation is not required. The services are required uh, to just be reflected on the plan of care and a referral is, is to be made by the care manager. So the level of care determination will establish the child's eligibility for this service. Now, of course, when these services do transition to becoming a child and family treatment support services, an, an LPHA recommendation will be required. So for example, um, if you are a family peer support service provider, uh, you have until July um, of 2019 to secure an LPHA recommendation for continued service of the children that you're serving under HCBS similar to uh, what was required to take place when we transition children's in the waiver to OLP, CPST, and PSR. Um, so there is some time for that for family peer support. Um, as I said earlier, uh, as an interim HCBS service, only a health home care manager or the independent entity for children who have opted out of health home and are receiving their care coordination services from CS which again is the Children and Youth Evaluation Services, um, can refer to an HCBS service provider. So in order for you as a designated family peer, youth peer, or crisis intervention provider to know that you are allowed and able to serve the child because they're HCBS enrolled, um, that will uh, be facilitated by a direct referral from a health home care manager or CS care coordinator who has verified that the child is in receipt of HCBS services and you are able to provide them services because they have conducted an HCBS eligibility determination and determined them eligible. So uh, that's the only way in which during the interim period um, designated peer providers or crisis intervention providers would be able to verify and begin providing services to HCBS children. Um, as always, HCBS providers themselves must develop and maintain an HCBS service plan for the services they provide. This is for documentation and billing purposes. Um, the service plan will um, be uh, consistent with any uh, typical service plan. It would include um, the, uh, the uh, goals and objectives of what uh, you're trying to accomplish in your work with the child, the interventions that you're going to be using to help address the needs of the child, uh, the scope, duration, and frequency of the services, that are being provided, who is providing the services, and of course, a signature by the um, child and family to verify that they agree with the plan as well. Okay, um, so I keep mentioning that uh, for family peer, youth peer, and crisis intervention, they will be authorized as interim HCBS until they are moved into the state plan and become a child and family treatment support service. So um, this slide uh, outlines the time frame at which the services will become a state plan service. So family peer support obviously will move to CFTSS in July of 2019, and youth peer support and crisis intervention will become a state plan service in January of 2020. So of course, once they transition to CFTSS, the service will then be available to all children who have Medicaid and meet the medical necessity criteria, and it will no longer be restricted to HCBS services alone after those dates. All right. So those are the key concepts associated specifically with these services. We're going to move into um, some of the general key concepts of what HCBS is. Um, Hopefully all of you are very familiar with these services. Uh, in my world, we call them many things. These are CAS principles. Uh, some people call them other, other uh, you know, principles. And, I, and these really um, embody and underlie all of the ways in which we provide services to children and families. I'm not going to go into them uh, with detail, but uh, we just, they uh, serve as a, a standard of care for working with children and families on an ongoing basis. 
So I also, uh, what's also important for everybody just to have a general understanding of is that in, in um, March of 2017, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services issued what's called an HCBS final rule. The HCBS rule included a number of different things, uh, including the expectations for person-centered planning, uh, the expectations for uh, conflict of interest and conflict-free case management, along with what's called the settings rule. And this uh, basically says that, that uh, home and community-based services are only allowed to be provided in the most least restrictive settings um, and most integrated home and community-based settings. So if you um, are aware, HCBS services cannot be provided to um, individuals who are in restrictive placements. This includes a hospital, a, um, any sort of facility like a residential treatment facility or a residential treatment center or any um, sort of home uh, such as a nursing home or a, um, uh, a restricted setting. Uh, and so these services are only available and children who are eligible for them have to be in what's considered to be their homes or a community-based setting that is uh, non-restrictive. And so um, this is just an important thing uh, to understand so that we, we know that, um, for example, if a child is in a, has a hospital stint while, in, um, while enrolled in the waiver, they can remain enrolled up to a certain period of time, but the services cannot be provided in the hospital while they're there. So that's one example of why that's an important um, rule to understand. Okay. So um, briefly, as you know, um, as we just reviewed in the timeline, because of the phased in nature of the uh, transition and the transformation, there are certain uh, billing implications that impact uh, not only how the services are provided, but how the services are billed. So uh, because we are not transitioning into um, the waiver services, the HCBS services into managed care until October of 2019, um, when we launch the children's waiver in April of 2019, the children's waiver will be under fee-for-service, will continue to be billed fee-for-service. So um, uh, specific to the services that we're talking about today, for family peer, when we initiate the children's waiver, the consolidated children's waiver starting on 4-1, um, providers will be billing fee-for-service for all HCBS enrolled children. However, again, for family peer, because Family Peer Support is moving to a CFTSS service starting in July. Um, CFTSS services are in managed care for children who are enrolled with the plan. Therefore, when it becomes a CFTSS service, you will bill, just like those providers of OLP, CPST, and PSR are doing now, you will bill managed care for the child who uh, is enrolled in a managed care plan, and if the child's not enrolled in a managed care plan, you will bill fee-for-service. Now the same goes for uh, youth peer and crisis intervention. Starting in April, um, as an interim HCBS service, the providers will bill fee for service. Starting in October, as with all other HCBS services, uh, they will also move into managed care under HCBS and uh, providers will bill managed care plans for children enrolled in a plan. And then in January, when these services become CFTSS services, uh, but now can serve a broader population of child even outside of HCBS. Uh, again, the billing will continue to be the managed care plan for managed care enrolled children. And any child who is um, otherwise excluded or exempt from managed care will be uh, billed fee for service as always. So hopefully that's helpful. And basically that's what we talked about. Uh, if the child's not in managed care, you bill fee-for-service. If the child's in, uh, in, in, in uh, managed care, you bill managed care based on what we just discussed. Um, there's some additional information that's available in the link provided. And um, if you don't have a, uh, a contract with a managed care plan, but for some reason you're serving a child that's enrolled in a managed care plan, a single case agreement would be, may be required and could be executed in order for you to get paid for the services rendered for that particular child if you're not in contract with a particular plan. Um, I also want to note that um, managed care plans will be required to pay government rates for at least 24 months from the date of service that, that the date that the service was included in the Medicaid managed care benefit package. Um, 
or however long New York State mandates. So uh, from the time at with which these HCBS services transition to managed care, there are 24 months uh, a time frame in which the managed care plans are required to pay government rates. So there's some protections there. All right. Okay. Uh, this is really tiny, so and I'm not going to read all of it, but um, I just want to highlight that uh, this information is in the manual, um, both actually manuals, um, and it speaks to the types of services and interventions that cannot be uh, reimbursed through Medicaid. So while these, these services are Medicaid reimbursable services, there may be some activities or aspects uh, of the services or ser that are not aspects of the services that are just generally not reimbursed through Medicaid. And so um, rehabilitative services do not include a federal share, which is a, which is a federal um, share of Medicaid for any of the following. And you'll see there's a large list. You should, if you have looked at the manual uh, at any point in time, you would have seen this. Things like um, room and board, habilitation such as financial management, housing and employment services, recreational or custodial uh, activities such as bathing, dressing, or eating, so on and so forth. Um, services don't include supplies, procedures performed in uh, resorts, spas, or therapeutic programs and camps, so you can't send someone um, to, uh, to a, a spa <laughs> and, and bill Medicaid, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, again, this, I'm not going to read this to you, which I highlighted some key points, but I'm not going to read it to you. You can always reference it the, uh, in the manuals. All right, so we're going to now start talking about the services themselves. Um, again, I'm going to basically highlight each of the content on the slides um, just for your reference, but the information that's reflected on each of these slides is also in the manual and can be found uh, there if you need to spend some more time uh, reading it in detail um, at a later time. So. Family peer support services. So family peer support services um, are uh, services that really help families who are, who are caring or raising a child who is experiencing social, emotional, medical, developmental, substance use, or behavioral challenges. Um, and they're really uh, working with the family to um, help uh, guide them, empower them, and support them in negotiating, negotiating and navigating how best to support uh, um, uh, dealing with a child who has these needs and, and how to negotiate the systems of care that that child might be engaged in and the people that that child might be working with in order to get supports and services. Um, what's one important thing to note is that when we say family, um, we really mean very broadly uh, a definition for family. It could really be uh, any, anyone that is identified by the child and by the caregivers as being family. So that's a birth parent, foster parent, adoptive, self-created unit, or people residing together that have caregiving responsibilities. Um, uh, so as long as somebody uh, is an adult uh, uh, caring for a child in some way, shape, or form, that's considered to be family and, and this service can support them. Um, I think we talk about it later, but I also just want to note that um, family peer support services are provided by uh, family peers. Peers are individuals who they themselves have lived experience, which means that in this case, as a family peer, you have a child yourself uh, or had caregiver responsibilities for a child who uh, was experiencing social, emotional, uh, developmental, substance use, or behavioral challenges. Uh, and so you have lived experience in order to um, uh, support and inform the work that you're doing as a peer support worker. Okay, uh, there's a number of different service components that are uh, part of the, the services. Obviously, engagement, bridging, transition support, um, these are various activities that really help to, um, uh, engagement is a big piece of, of, of this work, really helping parents to feel comfortable with, um, with uh, accessing help and reaching out to those who might be uh, able to support them in um, managing the challenges that their child has experienced, really assisting families um, in, in understanding the different services that are available and uh, 
helping to serve as an intermediary between accessing those services, um, also helping to support families as they transition from different settings or different levels of care. If the child is um, being discharged from a residential treatment placement or, some, or, or from a crisis or emergency program, uh, family peer support uh, individuals can really help families in uh, negotiating the transition and making sure that everything is in place for, in preparation for the child's return home. Self-advocacy, self-efficacy, and empowerment. So this is, uh, this is a lot of the work as well. Um, family peer support workers often help prepare families for uh, meetings that they may be having with, care, with the service providers for their child to help understand um, the nature of the services that are being provided, help um, work with them to maybe identify some questions that they have for the uh, service providers so that they make sure that they're covering all of the outstanding questions that they may be um, wondering about in regards to their child. Uh, it makes them, uh, helps to support them in making informed decisions about the services that their child is receiving and so on and so forth. So again, all of this is, is outlined in detail in the manual as well, so I won't read it to you. But really um, uh, modeling for parents uh, how they can advocate for themselves and how they can play an active role with the service providers in their child's treatment and empowering them to take on that role on an ongoing basis. Parent skill development, uh, which is basically what it sounds like, uh, really helping provide, uh, parents uh, and caregivers to, um, to uh, uh, figure out ways in which to um, uh, empower themselves to work, to, to uh, continue the work of, of supporting their child. Um, this could be in a group setting with other parents where they're getting parent skill development. Um, it could be uh, in dealing with the individual concerns that the parent has with um, some of their experience in navigating uh, for their child. Um, it could be some of the uh, uh, particular skills that they are helping the parent to, to learn to manage their child's behavior and support their child's positive behavior and reinforce some of the skills that the child may be learning uh, through their own individual therapy. So community connections and natural supports, um, it's very important. Oftentimes, um, parents can find um, uh, having a child with uh, significant uh, challenges being isolating and being uh, overwhelming, and uh, family peers can help parents really um, realize that actually um, engaging with the community or identifying other natural supports in their lives might actually be a support um, for them and helping them to identify those resources and get connected with the, with the community or others in their lives that might be helpful to them um, and supportive of them through the process. Okay. Uh, so obviously, as I mentioned earlier, family peer support is provided by individuals with lived experience. Um, we'll talk more about who, uh, the, who these qualified individuals are. Um, they provide family-driven practice by supporting parents. Uh, they increase social support by connecting parents to others, as, I, as we talked about. Um, and they work well with parents directly to enhance their capacity to parent their child uh, with challenges. And they uh, really help to negotiate the various child-serving systems that the child might be engaged in, whether it be with the school or with a mental health clinician or with probation or so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way in which parents get the support that they need while their child is engaged in treatment, hopefully getting uh, the services that they need as well. So here's just a quick example uh, of a scenario in which a child is receiving um, this service. So Brian, who is a transitioning child from the current OMH uh, SED waiver for children with uh, significant mental health concerns, has parents, Mark and Ro uh, has parents Mark and Roger and a grandmother Dot continue to access family peer support after April 1st that they had received under the OMH waiver. Brian and his family attend a small group led by a credentialed family peer advocate with a few other children and their families where they can learn from each other's experience and offer each other support. During the small group sessions, the families discuss resources and contacts, uh, and they assist each other in connecting with others to become involved in their communities. And so this is a great example of, of some of the activities that we talked about earlier. Um, so this service can be provided face-to-face -to, -face to the individual. It could be a face-to-face -face group, um, and the group should not exceed 12 individuals total. Again, this is all in the manual, so I'm not going to... 
Uh, okay, so the staff qualifications. The two um, types of qualifications that are um, available, uh, again, these are really intended uh, to be for individuals who have children with a myriad of issues, particularly those with mental health concerns or, or substance use concerns. And so these credentials really reflect a, uh, a, an extensive uh, training and education around um, working with parents and caregivers of children with behavioral health needs, whether it be mental health or substance use. So we have a credentialed family peer advocate, um, which is through uh, Families Together and CTAC. And we have the credentialed recovery peer advocate with a family specialty. And that information on that, uh, what's called SERPA F, is available through um, ASAP, um, which is something that I should know, but I forget offhand. <laughs> Uh, adolescent Substance Abuse something of New York State. <laughs> um, so obviously, in order to be a, uh, a provider of this service, to be Medicaid reimbursable, you must be designated through the provider designation team and receive a designation letter from the state, uh, which will outline uh, who you're allowed to serve and, and how based on your application. Again, there are some specific uh, limitations and exclusions associated with the family peer uh, support service. 12-step uh, programs are not um, reimbursable under Medicaid. Um, contacts that are not medically necessary are not uh, reimbursable. Time spent doing or attending recreational activities. Um, so if you're using family, if you're a family peer support person and you're solely going on a field trip uh, with a family recreationally, um, uh, for recreational purposes, um, that's not allowable to be reimbursed. Habilitative services also, uh, which we talked about earlier, um, are not uh, reimbursable. And so again, these lists are available in the manual, and you can look at them for greater detail. Again, um, respite care is not reimbursable under this. Uh, children who are enrolled in the Home and Community-Based Services Program do have access to respite care. Um, and uh, through that service, children can receive respite, but not through family peer support. Um, the services are not identified on the beneficiary's authorized service plan. So for the purposes of HCBS interim services, this service must be listed on um, the health home plan of care, uh, as well as obviously being listed on the service provider's HCBS service plan. Um, and obviously, when it becomes a CFTSS service, these services will be recommended by a licensed practitioner of the healing arts and included on a treatment plan managed by the service provider. Again, the, the full list and the detail is in the manual. Great. All right, so we're going to talk briefly about youth peer support training. Hmm? That's it, huh? One hour? Oh. All right, I got to speed up. <laughs> so the good news is that there's a lot of duplication uh, and overlap in some of the content that's in both slides. So we went over them previously. We'll, we'll briefly go over them for youth peer support. So youth peer support and training is very uh, comparable to family peer support, except for the fact that um, this is a person of, with lived experience who, as a youth themselves, has had involvement in the children's behavioral health system. Um, and so youth peers are intended to support young people, the young people uh, in, in, uh, in the service system, not necessarily the caregivers or the parents, but to help engage and help the young person um, in, in engaging with services and in learning about the services that they're receiving and in navigating the services that they might be engaged in. Um, some of you may also be familiar with uh, peers on the adult side. Uh, the youth peer service is comparable to an adult peer where they're working with someone who uh, is actually the uh, person engaged with the service directly. So these are formal and informal services that helps a youth who is experiencing the challenges um, uh, navigate the system and, and uh, become an active, engaged participant in their own care and make informed decisions. Um, the youth peer support now, uh, one of the unique features is obviously this is called youth peer support and training. So there's a little bit more of kind of hands-on um, coaching and, and maybe a training and education uh, that might take place in this service. But there's a, a skill, to, skill building component where the youth peer can really help to work with the young person to identify their own um, skills 
for wellness and resiliency and recovery support, um, for independence, uh, for independent living skills or community living skills. There's also coaching where they can uh, enhance their recovery-oriented attitudes uh, to develop hope and confidence and self-efficacy, promoting wellness through modeling and, and how to really reinforce um, effective uh, wellness skills and activities such as you know, exercise, eating right, um, and so on and so forth, and direct individuals to um, where they might be able to uh, explore resources in their community to help uh, support those wellness activities. All right. Um, again, as we talked about earlier, self-advocacy, self-efficacy, and empowerment. So this is very comparable to what we uh, talked about earlier, uh, but, but this time it's really directed towards the young person, the young person playing an active role and being an active participant in their own care and in negotiating uh, and, uh, for their in, with the service providers and in their own systems. So um, this might be that uh, a, youth, a youth advocate is helping the child, the young person, to really identify what are your questions or what do you want to see happen um, through this service or uh, in this meeting or with this discussion and what are your goals and thinking and working with that young person prior to that, uh, that, in, that meeting or that, uh, or that interaction so that they're really prepared to communicate their wants and needs in a very productive and effective way and empowering them to speak out for themselves and to use their voice to really communicate uh, what they feel is in their best interest. Um, so again, community connections and natural supports, helping them identify the resources and services and um, the individuals in their communities or in their families or uh, in, their, in their environments who can really help to support them uh, and in, and, uh, during the time that they're um, engaged with treatment. Uh, and how they can uh, access those resources to support them in times of need. Engagement, bridging, and transition support, uh, again, is the same thing. Engaging the young person uh, in, in participating actively in their own care or helping to prepare them for any significant transitions that they're experiencing, whether it be coming from a higher level of care or whether it be coming back from maybe a, a crisis or emergent situation uh, back into their home and their community. So why offer youth peer support? Um, because it's a, it's a wonderful service that engages young people to play an active role in their care um, and helps to expand their skills and helps to prepare them for um, potentially their transition to adulthood depending on their age and really um, think about what, is in their, what their wants and needs are and be able to speak to that um, productively. So here's a wonderful example. Uh, this example is specifically for a SERPA Y, um, which is a, a um, credentialed, uh, or I'm sorry, certified recovery peer advocate with a, a youth specialty. So Leo uh, meets with his youth peer advocate, his SERPA Y, to assist with substance use challenges. The advocate provides mutual support, hope, and reassurance and advocacy that includes sharing one's own personal recovery and resilience story as a youth peer advocate deems appropriate as beneficial to both the youth and themselves. Leo meets with the um, youth advocate in the community to engage in substance-free recreation and leisure to assist in developing skills for wellness and recovery. And so the, obviously the youth peer is modeling um, these behaviors and is, and is talking with them and working with them on how to really integrate wellness and recovery-oriented activities in their daily life. Um, Leo's youth peer advocate also helped him start to explore available adult, adult services he'll soon be eligible for in preparation for him becoming an independent young adult. Okay, again, available as an individual or group face-to-face, -face, uh, which should not exceed eight members total. Again, this detail is in, uh, available in the manual. Um, as we talked about with the family peers, there are two types of um, peer advocate trainings, one of which both are very oriented to behavioral health, one more so mental health, the other substance use. Uh, for the mental health one, it's uh, through, again, Families Together and CTAC, whereas the um, uh, credentialed recovery youth peer advocate, the SERPA-Y, uh, is also available through, oh, ASAP, I think. Um, I didn't put the link there. But um, they're, they're in the process of also developing a, uh, a credential, um, and they, uh, they would have additional information about this as well. Okay. 
obviously, as always, um, these uh, we don't designate individuals, we designate providers. So the folks who would be able to provide the service have to be part of a designated agency that was designated as such through the New York State Children's Provider Designation Review Team, and they have a designation letter saying that they are authorized to do so. Um, I'm not going to really go over the limitation exclusions. They're very similar to that uh, that was listed under family peer support, but again, these limitations and exclusions are available in the manual, and you can review them in greater detail and at your leisure um, in that document. Okay, so we're going to go over crisis intervention. Okay, so um, crisis intervention is an interim service under HCBS because there were aspects of uh, the um, waiver programs that allowed for immediate crisis response. Um, so in order to facilitate access to uh, crisis intervention services, um, this service is an interim HCBS service until it becomes a uh, CFTSS services. So uh, these are mobile crisis services that are provided to children under the age of 21 who are identified as experiencing an acute psychological emotional change which results in a marked increase in personal distress, uh, which exceeds the abilities of the resources of those involved, like a, a family or a provider, to effectively resolve the situation. Okay. Um, so what is crisis intervention? So I'm going to go over a couple of different aspects of what crisis intervention is, but I want to say that um, at this time there are very few designated crisis intervention providers. Um, we, uh, there's a handful of them uh, sprinkled throughout the state, um, and this is because we acknowledged uh, in New York State that when we developed the crisis intervention service that so, quote unquote, out, immediately out of the gate, we weren't going to be able to have a crisis uh, intervention system of care that would really be uh, fully operational and available to provide services on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week basis uh, with an hour response time. So if you, see, if you see in our manual, or we'll discuss shortly, that that is an expectation for crisis intervention, um, New York State acknowledges that that's something that we need to build over time. We need to build capacity for, we need to build um, support for, we need to build uh, multiple reimbursement components for uh, to really make it a viable, um, established resource uh, statewide for all children. So while, so I just want to, to um, note that while we're saying that the service is available to children uh, for, uh, who are enrolled in HCBS, I will say that um, at this time it likely will be available for certain children uh, for a certain period of time in the day uh, with a certain response time initially that may exceed an hour in response time uh, due to our still uh, ramping up and building a, uh, a system and continuum of care to really create a widespread mobile response um, capacity within New York State as a whole. So over time, uh, New York State's vision uh, across the multiple child serving systems is to achieve a real robust uh, crisis intervention uh, system of care, um, but it will happen um, over time and not uh, immediately. So. So as, a designated, uh, as designated crisis providers increase their capacity, the state will provide a list of crisis intervention providers and hours of availability initially. Uh, for crises that occur outside of provider availability, the child and family will be directed to utilize their community resources or other identified resources uh, that they've identified with their care manager on their plan of care. And so, as you know, um, as is normal course of business, a care manager often may develop a um, a safety plan or a crisis plan with their um, child and family, and on such plan they would identify the varying, varying resources that would be available to them at um, different times um, in case of crisis. And so certainly if they have an identified crisis provider that has certain hours, that would be on the plan, but then there'd be an, uh, other identified resources on that plan of care that would talk about when that crisis program is not available, who that family should contact at that time. So again, much of this information is in the manual, and I do want to allow for time for questions. So I just will briefly say that um, the crisis intervention service and the reimbursement for that service begins with the initial face-to-face -face and the contact with the child. This crisis intervention service is face-to-face -face only, and uh, um, that's when the, the service becomes a reimbursable service. Um, 
So uh, the crisis intervention provider can do some care coordination to connect with service providers after the crisis episode to notify them uh, of, of uh, the occurrence and to work with them to assure that uh, there's follow-up with the child and family as needed uh, to assure safety and that services are, are continuing and in place after the crisis episode. Um, Follow-up may, uh, may take place to include further assessment and support of the family. The end of the crisis episode uh, is defined by the resolution of the crisis. If, in fact, the another crisis episode uh, occurs after an initial 72 hours, that's considered a new crisis episode. Okay. So this is information about the crisis intervention team. Again, it's in the manual, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Basically, in essence, it says the, the expectation is that the crisis intervention team uh, includes two individuals. They can be, uh, and one of those individuals needs to be a licensed practitioner. So it can be two licensed practitioners or it can be a licensed practitioner and a peer. Um, and so uh, um, that, uh, that's a requirement for crisis response. Uh, if, though, it's determined through triage that only one team member is needed to respond to the psychiatric crisis, then that uh, individual must be a licensed practitioner and have uh, experience in this response. Um, there's some unique uh, guidelines around working um, with, uh, uh, in regards to responding to a substance use crisis. Uh, there's um, language around um, the utilization of a credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselor, a KSEC. Um, and how <clears throat> there should be special attention paid to individuals with um, significant substance use crises. A peer a specialist, although, may not respond alone. Um, there's a number of activities that a crisis intervention uh, team can uh, provide. Again, they're outlined in the manual. Obviously, they would assess for risk. They would conduct crisis planning with the family. Um, to um, determine immediate risk and safety concerns and prevent future crises. As I mentioned, care coordination, they can consult with their existing service providers uh, and will make any linkages to other providers that uh, they see that the child and family require. They would do crisis resolution and debriefing, which is some counseling uh, with the family, and they would also provide peer support if one of the individuals responding uh, on the team was a peer support provider. Um, uh, why offer it to help uh, work with families in crisis, engage them, and to reduce their symptoms and stabilize them and connect them with needed services. So here's a quick example. Uh, George has experienced a crisis situation that exceeded the resources of his caregiver in the home, so they called the crisis provider. It was determined through the triage phone call that George was experiencing an acute uh, crisis and needed the response of a crisis team. So a team uh, was uh, dispatched, one licensed practitioner, one uh, a peer, to help uh, de-escalate the crisis and reinforce the safety plan. Um, after the crisis situation, the team discovered that George had a regularly scheduled appointment the next day, and uh, so there was really no need for additional resources prior to the appointment. But the crisis intervention provider uh, did a follow-up call later to discuss with the family the situation and um, reinforce tips for promoting their coping mechanisms and reduce future crises, which was part of the crisis plan developed uh, with the family during the crisis um, response intervention. Again, um, all service components are meant to be provided individual face-to-face, -face, and a, but the follow-up may be conducted by the phone. Uh, here are the qualified individuals that could provide the crisis service. Um, again, as noted earlier, uh, when we say family peers, we mean either a, a credentialed family peer or certified recovery peer advocate, a SERPA-F. Um, and again, in order to provide crisis intervention, you have to be a designated provider by the state. All right, so this is Tanya Olson from GOH. Um, in the interest of time and getting to questions, we only have about 10 minutes. We've included the eligibility crosswalk slides, which many of you guys are familiar with. Um, it's been in all of these webinars, and this is the fourth. Um, it was also in the in-person trainings, um, but and you guys are transitioning children today, so um, that is the crosswalk of what services the 1915B children are using today versus, and then moving over into uh, what it is on 4.1. 
There's also some eligibility slides here um, and some uh, resource slides at the end. So please take a look at those. And actually, there's some questions that do um, that refer to some of these slides. So I think we should just go straight to the questions. We only have about 10 minutes. Great. Questions? Well, I can answer the first question, which is asking if there will be consumer-friendly material for these uh, children's home and community-based services. And the answer is yes, absolutely. The state is in the process of developing these materials now. There will, at minimum, be a brochure, a fact sheet and an FAQ document. Those will all be released um, shortly. Um, the brochure should actually be posted online within the next few weeks. It will be available at the Department of Health and Office of Mental Health web pages. Um, so be on the lookout for those coming soon. So the, qu the second question was around uh, just youth peer. When is it? Is it an HCBS service on 4-1? Yes. And it, on, um, 1-1-2020, one, one, it will be a CFTSS service. Um, is there, do we provide a link to the ACVS manual in here? One of the questions. Um, these are our resource links. All right, so we will add the link to the manual to this slide? Yeah, it just it links the whole page with all of the content, but it doesn't specify the manual. So as of 4-1, if you are not designated for crisis intervention, you can no longer uh, provide crisis response. Um, so that's a little bit of a complicated question because crisis response is what you guys provide today. Um, we have found that some of the components of crisis response can be um, delivered through CPST and OLP as well as crisis intervention. So we think that we have enough coverage uh, for you guys to be able to provide the service. but. Anybody who is providing any of these services must be designated for the service uh, before 4-1. Okay. Um, so, which one did you answer? Hi, I just want to let everyone who's on the webinar know that we're still here. OMH is just um, taking a look at the questions so they can um, try to cluster them and organize their responses to your questions. So there was a question about um, if these services will be available only to those children that are transitioning from a waiver today to tomorrow. And um, the answer to that is all the children that are transitioning, yes, those children will have access to these services. Um, we believe that we'll be able to accommodate um, additional children on 4-1, um, and we're not sure how many that is right now. But they need to, so in order to get these services, I just want to make sure I say this out loud, is that uh, they have to meet HCBS eligibility. So anyone for these services, crisis, youth, or family peer support has to be uh, found HCBS eligible. Question is, as of uh, April 1st of 2019, if you're not designated for crisis intervention, you can no longer provide crisis response, correct? That is response. That is correct. Did you say that right? Did you? Yeah. I, can't, I can't read it and hear it and listen at the same time. Okay. <laughs> and I need to make, I can't see either. I need to make it bigger. <laughs> Um, so 
So uh, will the codes and rates, did you do that one? Will the codes and rates be the same for youth peer and crisis intervention when under HCBS than when under CFTSS? The answer to that is yes. Um, we, are, we are using the, code, the same codes and rates on, uh, for family peer, youth peer, and crisis intervention under HCBS as we are for CFTSS. So um, it, will see, it will be seamless to the provider when we, when we quote unquote flip the switch because uh, you'll be using the same rates and codes the whole time. You're welcome. Uh, there's a question about, um, are you able to talk about the level of care process for HCBS eligibility? There seems to be some confusion on uh, when that needs to be done and how often it needs to be done. So the new um, eligibility process was recently outlined um, last week, was it, or two weeks ago? Um, and I think it's mentioned on the slide that it was on, uh, I think, March 13th. So that presentation, the Children's HCBS Eligibility Presentation, is available um, on the MCTAC uh, website. Um, and so that's recorded and you can listen to that. It goes all over what is the HCBS eligibility process and how do you determine level of care under uh, the Children's Consolidated Waiver starting in April. Uh, there's a question that says, will there be funding for recreational or social activities? Um, and, I, and I'm assuming that that's in, in, in specifically um, talking about what is called flex funds in the current OMH 8 SED waiver. Um, and so the answer to that is flex funds will be going away March 31st, uh, 2019, uh, and will not be a part of the children's waiver on, uh, starting on 4-1. So there will not be... Um, flex funds for social recreational activities. So there was a, a couple of comments on a uh, ramp up of crisis intervention and I think that they're worth noting that um, a suggestion to collaborate with law enforcement and um, other services in the community and that is our intention um, to collaborate with the communities that these providers would uh, reside in. So the staff qualifications for family peer supports, yes, they do start on 4-1. Um, they are exactly the same on 4-1 as they are on 7-1. So you still have to be credentialed either way. Um, there's a question, will all B2H kids need a new HCBS level of care completed for the month of April? The answer to that is no, not unless their level of care is due in the month of April. Um, level of care renewals and recertifications are based on their current 1915C waiver date of recertification, uh, not on, uh, for transitioning kids. So the date that your child needs a recertification, that's when they should be doing a recertification. So if it's before um, April, they should be using the current waiver level of care process. If it happens after April 1st, they should be using the new HCBS eligibility process under the children's waiver. So there's a question if there is a link uh, to see licensed uh, providers for crisis intervention. And when we add that link for the manual, you will be able to see who those uh, providers are. They are actually in the slides as well. Designated providers are in the no, slides? licensed providers or licensed. I think they're talking about licensed practitioners. 
Oh, who's qualified. I'm sorry. Okay. If you're looking for, so I guess that may, maybe the question's a little confusing. If you're looking for who are designated crisis intervention providers, those are on the DOH website, and we, w we can add that link as well. So we can cover both the practitioners and the providers. So um, there's a question about can we bill for non-medical transportation? That's not part of these slides, but we do have it as part of an HCBS service, and there'll be more information to come on that. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Ann Cuppinger from McTac. Um, I just want to note that we've reached 11 o'clock. If uh, you want to handle a couple more questions, that would be great. Um, and then if we don't get to all the questions, we can re uh, include them in the question and answer document that we'll publish um, along with the slides. Got a, one more? Go ahead. I, 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 um, So somebody said, uh, I may have missed it, but have we been told the possible duration and scope of each service, how many hours and for how long can they be provided? So in the HCBS manual, there are limitations, uh, service limitations for each service, uh, but that's the extent uh, at, to which you can, can provide the services. Um, but the, the need for the services is uh, determined by the individualized person-centered planning that you'll do with the child and family uh, once you receive the referral and, how you, and what you reflect in your HCBS service plan. It's the service plan's provider uh, responsibility, service plan provider's responsibility uh, for HCBS to, to um, determine scope, duration, and frequency based on the needs. So some children and families may need a service, um, you know, twice a week for, uh, you know, an hour each. Some children and families might only need it once a week. Uh, it really depends on the individualized needs. And as long as it's within the limitations, the service limitations in the manual, then that's, that's appropriate. And that's what you should reflect on your HCBS service plan and what you should notify the health home care manager uh, of, uh, for, for frequency, scope, and duration for inclusion into the larger plan of care. So for a final question, there was a question about um, will families have a choice and how will they know what their choices are for service providers in their area? And that conversation will happen with the health home care manager um, when they're uh, reviewing the services that would go on their service or on their uh, plan of care. So families absolutely will have choice of uh, what providers they uh, choose to engage with. Okay. All right. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today um, and especially thank our presenters. Um, there was certainly a lot of information and I am aware, um, as are our presenters, that there are a number of questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, there are frequently, or I guess, question and answer documents um, associated with each of these webinars in development. Um, so there will be such a document for this webinar and for the others in this series. Um, and we'll um, post those when they're complete on the uh, MCTAC website along with the slides. Uh, so with that, I want to wish everyone a good day and um, thank you very much for joining us.